now I turn to um, our final session. Uh, our third speaker today is Dr. Jonathan Teutner, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University uh, and Humboldt fellow at the um, uh, Humboldt University Berlin. His research lies at the intersection of theology, history and politics with a special focus on religious practices in the early medieval period, political Augustinianism, critical theories of religion and violence, economics, secularism, and historiography of the discipline, especially on the relationship between theology and religious studies. He is currently beginning a major reassessment of the work and influence of Adolf von Harnack, focusing particularly on his um, uh, commitment to educational and religious institutions as a theological act. His paper today draws from this work um, and is entitled Theology, History, and the University, Hans Frey as Genealogist of Modern University Theology. Um, all yours, Jonathan. Thank you, Pui, and thanks to Darren and everyone who's made this wonderfully rich uh, conversation possible. I've already learned quite a lot um, about um, not only just the topic, but about um, all the views that are kind of going in and being contested here under this um, topic. So to say a little bit about, I guess, my paper, the paper is really a reflection on Hans Frey and his attempt to offer over his lifetime, a kind of genealogy of modern Christology. Frey is perhaps best thought of as a historical theologian, but he has received very little reception among historical theologians. He is rather treated as a systematic or maybe dogmatic theologian. His works that are best known to people are the Eclipse of Biblical Narrative and the Identity of Jesus Christ. And these were taken up mostly by people who identify as systematic theologians. And they are like, in, I guess in the terms of our conference, I'd say they're very, they're largely intellectual genealogies. But late in his life, Fry turned to reflect on the institutional genealogy that undergirds many of the developments that he was tracking. And so it's really this nexus of intellectual and institutional genealogy that, um, that kind of most intrigued me about him. And so, but ultimately, I mean, let me just say this, I think there are a fair number of shortcomings in Fry's proposal. Um, so I wouldn't want to endorse it wholesale, but I do think it is like a helpful provocation. Um, and the shortcomings I see are um, perhaps a little bit different from those that Christina might lay out um, in her response. But because Fry is really no longer a household name, or rather one that um, maybe it's better to say he no longer presents very many theologians with a timely option. I'm going to offer some comments about my motivation for writing about Fry um, before turning to something like an overview of the paper. Um, I guess just one other more kind of introductory comment. Um, I think I should say like uh, others have said that I'm somewhat ambivalent about the category or genre of genealogy or like I'm not particularly committed to defending it or just destructing it in any way and I don't see any ineradicable problems with it or any reason to put it methodologically out of bounds of course but I do think how we use the genealogies and whether we allow them to become the ends in themselves um, seem more significant um, and where like the debate should actually occur over it. Um, the attractiveness of genealogies and really a lot of other ambitious historical projects that really won't, you know, do not, and the, their authors don't want to classify them as genealogies, is that they can help signpost, you know, what, you know, something contingent about our current arrangements and what could have been otherwise. That is to say, they are important tools, but like all tools, they must be put to use. And when done well, I think theological genealogies and modernity can help indicate how we can actually change our current arrangement. My fear or rather annoyance with certain genealogies is that they are fundamentally unserious. Given what they say about our current predicament and you know, the terms in which they put it, what should we like do something about this? If if those are if those claims are something correct, it seems like well, we need we have some pretty serious conversations we should have. And I know the some people here who um, are you know pursuing those conversations so i don't want to um just say everyone's doing this anyway um so fry's enduring value to me at least is that 
his turn to the institutional helps open up some conversations in which we can talk about the process of reform along the lines that would be most suitable to 21st century university theology. So let me turn to my kind of my motivation for writing about Fry. I became interested in Fry as I've been thinking about the disciplinary history of historical theology, um, a discipline that I largely you know, identify myself with. Um, and it's really historical theology is an odd discipline that is suspended halfway between systematic or constructive theology, if you will, and what we quaintly used to call church history. Um, as frustrating as it might seem to my colleagues and um, and as quixotic as it certainly is within the 21st century academy, historical theologians really are in some sense both historians and theologians. But it's, and it's just this oddity that I think would make a lot of historical theologians ideal contributors to theological genealogies of modernity. However, I think it's fair to say, um, and maybe some people will contest that historical theologians have on the whole played a relatively minor role in thinking about genealogies of modernity in recent decades. There was a time of course, when I think people we might classify that way as scholars of history of Christian thought or dogma were pursuing something like a genealogy of modernity. I'm thinking here, of course, of Henri de Lubac, um, but also I think you can classify Aldo von Harnack and his massive history of dogma as an attempt to do something like a genealogy of modernity, one that's, you know, is kind of puzzling in a lot of respects to us. Perhaps it is better to say that, you know, they, like a Lubac was pursuing the history of the present moment of Christian teaching and whether this fulfills any you know, formal criteria or stipulated or implied criteria that is um, a of genealogy doesn't seem relevant here. Of course, there are some historians today, historians of Christian doctrine, who do see themselves contributing to a theological genealogy of modernity. But I think it is fair to say, and here, I guess this is specifying something of my own uh, perspective, that is particularly my fellow Protestants in the discipline of historical theology who have dropped out of this conversation or really never joined it maybe. There are multiple factors, but I suspect that one significant factor is that most practitioners of historical theology have not fully appreciated the oddity of the discipline within the context of the modern university, and therefore have no professional use with many of these genealogies to say the least. The discipline of historical theology arose for the most part after the onset historical critical tools became available and developed as a discipline alongside those analytic tools. While many Protestant theolog historical theologians have been the forefront of sharpening these tools and have been expert users of those tools, they have not tended to question the toolkit with much intensity or regularity. So to frame my contribution this way is to introduce at least implicitly an institutional frame of reference certain tools, approaches, methods are created, refined, and passed on within pedagogical contexts. There's always some diversity within any discipline or department, but there is, I think, I think it's fair to say, a certain family resemblance between those, a set of approaches that are consistently affirmed by peers, colleagues, and department heads, and what a, you know, what a other gatekeeper type figures. My fellow Protestant historical theologians are for the most part working within the context of modern institutions of higher learning, and, you know, as I am. And this has been true for the better part of the last two centuries. Historical theologians are really university theologians. There's really no other use for us, a place for us sometimes. So to think about the history of our discipline must necessarily bring us into conversation with those who think about theology's place at the university. This paper, then I really would kind of categorize it or you know, describe it as an exercise in trying to come to terms with the institutional context of historical theology. That is a discipline that arose in the 19th century university and developed according to the institutional constraints and possibilities of the modern university. So this is all by way of background to say that I'm somewhat predisposed if not invested in thinking about the institutional context for theological genealogies and modernity, both, of this, both as a source of the content and as a location of the production of the genealogies themselves. But I think the institutional aspect has been underappreciated or maybe even relatively neglected 
by most theological genealogies of modernity. Moreover, I suspect that one of their largely unstated problems with modernity is in fact the university. If in fact, um, if only because it is the modern institution with which genealogists um, are most familiar. Um, there are of course, other more pr principled reasons for this, um, especially for those who seek to work within strands of mystical theology. Um, this accusation I've just leveled at genealogists is of course not originally mine. Um, many have said something similar, if with different interests and programs of mine. But I think it's to Fry, but I think it's to Fry's credit that he saw this blind spot in his early work and went about attempting to write an institutional genealogy of academic theology before he could set about writing his modern history of Christology. Sadly, Fry's sudden death prevented us ever doing much work beyond the institutional genealogy. So let me just kind of offer a quick overview of the paper. So there's a lot one could say about a larger frame of reference for one relatively minor now historical theologian's opus imperfectum. But what most intrigues me about Fry is that on the one hand, Fry is very self-consciously standing at the intersection of Karl Barth and those we might call liberal Protestants. And on the other hand, he stood at kind of the crossroads of methods that were current in departments of religious studies and those more traditional ones that were practiced in divinity schools and seminaries. And he's trying to like put these kind of pieces together in some way. and. Um, to various levels of success, I think. Well, Fry's answers aren't obviously going to receive much take up today. I do think he is helpful in thinking about the confluence of intellectual and institutional genealogies of our present moment. So in the paper, I frame Fry's contribution with Web John Webster's article, Theologies of Retrieval, where he uses the phrase theological genealogies, modernity, and perhaps he coins it. And and then I kind of look at um, Lewis Ayers, who's endorsed um, in a series of forthcoming articles that Ayers has coming out, endorsed Webster's framework, but um, I think Ayers would want me to say he endorsed it from a Catholic perspective. And so I pull out two claims Webster makes. First, the history of modern theology should not be narrated as the defenselessness of Christian self-description against the onslaught of critical reason. And second, a new form of narrating requires the availability of robust versions of Christian teaching. These claims more or less adequately describe what I think Fry is up to in the, the eclipse and identity. And Webster at one point calls out Fry as um, a practitioner of theological genealogies and modernity. But what Ayers helps us draw out of Webster's framing is I think the question of modern university and the ways in which it might constrain in Lewis and Ayers account, the tasks that are central to theological genealogies of modernity, especially those who seek to offer alternative narratives. So my focus in the paper is thus on how Fry begins to rethink certain foundational aspects of eclipse and identity through his consideration of the institutional location of theology at the university and the possibilities and constraints that this location offers. Fry's historical focus is on what he calls the Berlin model or that vision, vision of Wissenschaftliche Theologie, initially set out by Friedrich Schleiermacher at the beginning of the 19th century and later transformed by Harnack at the beginning of the 20th. Fry has a lot to say about Schleiermacher's program, but he ultimately, I think, identifies the moment of decline, if you will, at Harnack's transformation. At issue is Harnack's shifting theology's disciplinary standards from philosophy to history, a shift that Fry thinks is on the whole negative. So I've tried to show, so what I've tried to do is show how Fry came to the realization that his narrative of intellectual decline needed supplementation by a narrative of institutional decline. But this was more than a methodological issue for Fry. One aspect that arises in Harnack's well-traveled public debate with Bart is the question about, about whether Bart's theology can build a community. Harnack obviously has in mind an intellectual community based at the university. Can the scheme Bart is proposing find a basis for mutual conversation with others at the university? This question I suggest provides a reframing for Fry's later works and where and how he seeks to keep theology in conversation with other university disciplines. The short of it is that Fry wanted theologians to find common cause with the practices of social science, 
is in this sense that far from providing a broad scale attack on Schleiermacher's model or even Harnack's transformation, Frey wants to retain the overall institutional approach of Wissenschaftliche of Theologie, but with different forms of engagement with it. Needless to say, this doesn't relieve much pressure on theology from the outside, as it were. I think Fry is still vulnerable to certain Bardian accusations that his methodological accommodation is subverting of theology, including his proposal for seeking common cause with social scientific practices. But theology's freedom from other disciplines and their standards wasn't really Fry's goal. Rather, Fry was concerned about theology maintaining a sense of shared discourse and common purpose in society. He was, in this sense, a publicly engaged theologian, albeit one who tarried almost the entire professional life inside the privileged walls of Yale colleges. So I think there's a sense in which Fry attempts to have the aims of liberal Protestantism, albeit informed in his American context, but to go about this with, say, let's say Wittgenstein and Goetz, as opposed to idealism or historicism. But the lesson I take from Fry is that for this, let's say, post-liberal scheme to work, he needed to narrate himself into the institution of the university. But for that to remain feasible, however, Fry requires a more comprehensive vision of how practical and theoretical aspects fit together, including clarification over whether we can incorporate such practices beyond those favored by liberal Protestants and more easily analogized with social scientific practices. I'm thinking here about whether practices such as prayer and fasting have any hope of incorporation in such visions. And I think it's obvious that it's yeah, pretty negative. Um, so I think we can read Fry showing us that perhaps we need neither an intellectual nor an institutional geology, but rather a reconsideration of theological education itself. So let me here, just in closing, return to my ambivalence with geneal genealogies. Genealogies can do important work. And I think you know, the, the people who are the expert practitioners here have shown, and this conversation reveals that it's very significant work. And I think like Fry, you know, I think more work should be done on the institutional context um, of their subjects and production. But ultimately, I think they indicate for those of us who identify with the discipline of theology that we have serious and difficult discussions ahead of us. What place do theologians, qua theologians, have at the 21st century university? And what kinds of accommodations, protests, and debates will we need to have to remain at the university in some semblance of health, if in fact we, that's what we want to do? These are not exactly obvious questions of theological genealogies and modernity, but they are, to say the least, urged upon us by those genealogies. So thanks, that's all I have as by way of introduction. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your summary of your paper. That um, you will have an opportunity to spell out some of the details of how you read Fry in the discussion. Um, we're privileged today to have Professor Christine Helmer as a respondent to Jonathan's paper, and she is the Peter it's my professor of the humanities at Northwestern University. Um, the likes of Schleiermacher, Hanak, Trosh, and Bart should be music to her years. Having specialized for her career in Christian theology with particular attention to German intellectual history. So um, here I hand over to you, Christine, to give us your response. Thank you. Um, thank you also to, to Jonathan for um, allowing me to engage with some of the points in his paper. And I also want to. Um, have a shout out to Ruth Jackson Ravenscroft, who is an expert in Schleiermacher and, and um, would also um, have, have great, um, great insights into this paper, especially regarding Schleiermacher on the role of philosophical theology and historical theology. Uh, and of course, Professor Cyril O'Regan, who, who is um, also uh, deeply familiar with Hans Frey's work. Jonathan's paper addresses the topic of theology as a viable discipline in the university. How is it that the production of theological knowledge in the university is related to other disciplines? What are its commitments to religious practitioners and leaders outside the university? And what are the different institutional conditions under which theology is practiced? And most importantly, Jonathan leaves us with a constructive question. How should theology be practiced today given different institutional entanglements but as I add, more importantly, in facing the insurmountable challenges of thinking and living at the end of the world. 
In order to answer these questions, uh, Jonathan looks to a historical era that was most consequential for the formation of theology as an academic discipline. And because I experience a lot of joy working through the careful historical uh, configurations of the early uh, 20th century, I will give you um, some a picture of, of how um, I look at this particular era in theological history. All theological roads lead to Berlin. Why? Germany had been the center of academic research since the founding of the research university in Berlin in 1809. The theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher had been tasked by the linguist Wilhelm von Humboldt to design the structure of what Friedrich III intended as a flagship university in Prussia after Napoleon had closed the University of Halle in 1806. The Friedrich Wilhelms University in Berlin, now called the Humboldt, institutionalized what Schleiermacher had theoretically worked out as a deduction of the idea of knowledge, the faculty of arts and sciences constituting the real sciences, and again, divided into the theoretical and applied sciences, and the positive sciences, the three to be exact, of which theology, law, and medicine are the three constituents. What Schleiermacher means by positive science, and this is really important because Jonathan does not mention this term, and I think it is because Fry does not mention this term, it is very important. What Schleiermacher meant by a positive science was that it is intended to produce knowledge towards application in an institution outside the university, namely the church. The significance of Schleiermacher's institutional arrangement for the real sciences and for theology was enormous. Students from North America would traverse the ocean in order to study at the University of Berlin. For example, a Harvard undergraduate by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois studied there from 1892 to 94, taking classes in economic history from two of the leading Lutheran historians who studied wealth inequality as a function of class. And Du Bois also took a class with the uh, Hermann Heinrich von Treitschke, a notorious anti-Semite who engaged in debate in 1879 with the Marburg philosopher Hermann Cohen on the topic of Jews in Imperial Germany. Theology students went to Germany and then Switzerland well into the 1960s in order to earn their doctoral degrees there. And German theologians continued to be influential in the fields of biblical studies and theology well into the 1980s. And where would we be in theology without the multi-volume German theological lexica, the RGG, the TRE, and the EDR. Jonathan's paper is less focused on Schleiermacher's innovation and more on a genealogy of modern theology that he lays at the feet of Hans Frey's reception of Schleiermacher, Harnack, and Bart. The German genealogy is significant for this question as to how theology is conceptualized as an academic discipline in the university. All modern theologians are indebted to how Schleiermacher envisaged theology as a positive science, precisely for the reason that theology's task is shaped by its interest in the church's flourishing. In order to serve this need, particularly the needs of church leaders to govern the church in ways oriented towards this flourishing, theological knowledge requires knowledge of the present state of the church which presupposes knowledge of how the past shapes the present. We have been recycling this mantra for two days now. As a result of Schleiermacher's innovation, theology, or more precisely, the three subfields of exegesis, church history, and dogmatic theology are considered historical disciplines, which as a whole are prefaced by philosophical theology and likewise culminate in practical theology. It is the status of philosophical theology's relation to the historical disciplines that has been sadly misunderstood and recycled in the literature. And it is particularly this misunderstanding in Fry that I would like to draw your attention to. Um, in Schleiermacher's own work, uh, he uh, addresses the topic of philosophical theology in his brief outline of 1811 and in paragraphs one to 31, comprising the introduction to the Christian faith. It is here on the rock of philosophical theology that Fry shipwrecks. Jonathan interprets this theological genealogy in the terms Fry uses and thereby recycles Fry's conceptual errors. We must pay close attention to the use uh, to Fry's terms. Page 13. Schleiermacher's understanding of the need to correlate two very different academic discussions and procedures. Page 14. 
history's value as the privileged agent in translating academic theology to the church. And again, on page 14, Harnack scientific program inserted as incoherence into the institutional practice of theology. This phrasing of the problem as correlation, translation and incoherence reveals, as I suggest, more about Fry than it does about what Schleiermacher was up to and Harnack imagined. The term correlate, and by this Fry um, intimates the correlation between philosophical theology and historical theology in Schleiermacher's work, is misleading because it presupposes that there is some sort of qualitative difference between these two theological subfields. Here we need to address the genealogy of this misunderstanding, namely in Barth's focus on one term in the brief outline in which Schleiermacher states that philosophical theology is above historical theology. This concept of above is, it is, should not be taken as Barth and then Fry did to mean a conceptual structure outside from the proper sphere of Christian discourse, namely from the secular sphere of, the, of academic production of knowledge, um, and thereby a rationality that would adjudicate the truth of Christian faith. Rather, Schleiermacher has something very much in mind. Second, I want to draw your attention to the term translation um, in the context of how Schleiermacher understands the relationship between the historical disciplines and practical theology. It is not a translation of knowledge from one sphere to another, but it is um, for Schleiermacher, practical theology is the theory of the practice that is then, um, that is then uh, interpreted as an art by the particular church leaders who have been learned, who have been educated in, the, in theology in the university and the way in which they individually embody that knowledge and apply it to a practical situation. Um, the term incoherence also betrays how Fry and Bart misunderstand the relationship between philosophical theology and the historical disciplines. I turned now to Harnack and Bart, and particularly um, addressing um, Fry's notion of, of incoherence uh, between academic theology and the experiential dimension of Christianity that requires a specific sort of theology for pastoral training. And this is very important when doing uh, what I would like to see as reception history or forensic historiography rather than genealogy, paying very close attention to how Harnack and Bart are negotiating their particular philosophical framework. And in that, um, in that era, it was the framework of neo-Kantianism introduced into the university by Hermann Cohen. Um, uh, in the early 20th century, there was a in, new interest in redefining or defining what Wissenschaft meant, particularly under the impact of this introduction of a new philosophical framework. Um, in a movement similar to Aquinas's appropriation of Aristotle amid the adoption of the Aristotelian philosophical framework for the University of Paris in the 13th century, so too should we regard this moment in German intellectual history as tantamount to the work of figuring out the nature of Wissenschaft at this time and for the rest of the 20th century. Theology, and, and I, I really would like to underscore this point, was not the only discipline trying to defend its viability over and against certain standards of Wissenschaft, but I like to see theology in conversation with the emerging disciplines of the social sciences, particularly anthropology, economics, and ethnomusicology, and in conversations with these sciences as they are all navigating this introduction of Wissenschaft and trying to figure out what that means for their particular context. I don't like to see theology on the defensive. I like to see the theologians of the time working across the aisle, so to speak, in trying to navigate what uh, Wissenschaft meant as a common, um, as a common basis for their, in, uh, for their work, as well as differentiating Wissenschaft with respect to their individual disciplines. So it is in this particular context, and I think more work needs to be done on, on looking at what neo-Kantianism meant and how the emerging sort of bifurcation between the Naturwissenschaften on the one hand and the Geisteswissenschaften on the other, as well as their 
constituent epistemologies. And these were very important questions, particularly for the neo-Kantians as to what constitutes knowledge and how knowledge claims can be made and on what basis. And this, I, they, this I argue is where Fry and um, really got off the bus um, because he did not appreciate that the ways in which the early 20th century theologians were navigating Christian experience and the production of doctrine had to do with actually a coherent relationship um, between those two areas of experience and discursivity that were being worked out. This is not to be considered an incoherence between experience or Christian faith and academic theology, but actually um, by virtue of, of its production within a neo-Kantian framework, actually a very coherent relationship. And, um, and uh, if you are more interested in looking at how particular theologians of this time are navigating this um, emerging interest in religious studies, in the understanding of how experience grounds particular epistemologies, which is the question of the neo-Kantian Geisteswissenschaftler, um, I can refer you to my book, uh, How Luther Became the Reformer, which was published a year and a half ago. So crucial here is the interest in religion this time, the Wissenschaft des Judentums was being constituted as in an institute in Berlin for the historical study of uh, Judaism. Orientalistic was also in the air, as well as the creation of the study of the history of religion school in Göttingen. In this excitement around the study of religion, and particularly its neo-Kantian framing, we see the theologians operating and trying to figure out how academic theology can be an explication and articulation in the terms of Wissenschaft on the grounds of its particular knowledge, um, a base, which is the experience of faith in Jesus Christ. So I look at the record and I don't see any incoherence there. I see um, a, a particular way of framing the relationship between experience and the production of knowledge um, that, is, that is coherent. When one investigates precisely Schleiermacher on the issue of philosophical theology in relation to historical theology or Harnack's academic theology in relation to Christian experience, one finds a very different picture than the one Fry leads us to believe. The categories of Fry's reception, in other words, reflect the slippage effected by his mapping of the bifurcation between Christianity and culture onto what he considers a divide between theology as an explication of Christian faith on its own terms and academic theology, which in his view requires a translation across an incommensurable divide. There is a slippage from a two worldviews model between Christianity and culture um, that ends up characterizing what he sees to the, as the problem of the theology in the university. Um, I'd like to um, just mention a historical point. Usually this uh, Bart Harnack divide is cast in that term of a bifurcation um, and the historical fact of Harnack signing the manifesto of the, of the 95 to support the Kaiser's invasion of Berlin in 1914 and Bart's uh, rejection of his teachers on that ground has been cited as the sort of original split between Harnack and Bart. Um, I would argue that Bart was part of this, an original Luther Renaissance um, that then um, from which dialectical theology emerged after, uh, the, after the war in 1918. So I don't see a split between the Luther Renaissance and dialectical theology as early as most people. Um, but I also think that Harnack's political um, political affinities can't be summarized by this one signature um, before the war beginning. I think it was in about 1911. Mark Chapman has a lot more to say about this. Um, Harnack founded an institution dedicated to pacifism and two of his own children were involved in as active anti-Nazi anti resistors. His daughter Agnes was a women's rights activist who dissolved her organization of women in 1933 to prevent the Nazis from amalgamating it into their association for women as a, as a product of their Gleichschaltung. And Harnack's son, Ernst, 
was a resistor and um, and he ended up being tried and executed um, with a death sentence in by the Nazis in Plötzensee in March 1945. Um, Harnack was absolutely devastated. So I don't want to put Harnack um, always um, on the um, on the Christian right. So I conclude with two points. Genealogy must take reception history seriously. I think reception history um, requires that we look at what, that we do a careful working out of the individual historical, institutional and political context of Schleiermacher in the early 19th century, of the reception of Schleiermacher's frame in the early 20th century with Harnack and Hull as proponents of the Luther Renaissance, but also in their dialogue um, with Ritchell who really should be seen at the sort of beginning of this um, late 19th, early 20th century trajectory on theology and the institution. And then um, looking at the, the relationships between Harnack and Bart, particularly after the war when Bart began moving away from uh, the Luther Renaissance and forging a new path. And then again, Fry's own uh, reception of this whole genealogy in the context of the 1960s at Yale Divinity School. So their reception history would carefully parse out or much more carefully parse out the categories that these individual theologians are using in their own terms and in their, um, as inflected by their own philosophical and institutional um, contexts um, that, that so I, I guess requires really then, you know, looking at um, and criticizing Fry for creating a genealogy based on his own um, category that bifurcates academic theology from um, theology as the self-explication of the Christian faith um, and imposing that as, um, uh, as I argue, an incorrect interpretation of, of my beloved Teutons. Um, <clears throat> the crucial point, though, of genealogy that Jonathan has raised for us today is not um, so much, though, about the past, but about the present. And it is to this question that we must draw our, our attention. I wonder at the coincidence between the precarity of theo theology in higher education and the precarity of the planet. Does theology's fragility have something to do with a planet in danger of destruction by fire? If there is indeed a correlation, then as theologians, we must be most vigilant in pursuing both together the renovation of theology as a discipline that vigorously promotes the self world God relation in whatever institution we find ourselves and an insistence on resisting planetary destruction by working towards its healing. The kind of theology the broken world needs now is not a frightened, loveless, defensive theology with its backwards looking declension but one that is liberally and generously open to the world's flourishing today and whatever comes tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for this wonderfully learned and detailed response. And I'm sure Jonathan will have plenty to say uh, in, in response. So in a minute, I'll bring back uh, my panelists. And meanwhile, please, um, audience, if you have a question, now is a good time to submit your question for me to bring them in. So Jonathan. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just say maybe three points here. Um, well, first off, thank you, Christine, for this wonderfully um, learned, like we said, um, trip through the 19th century. Um, I guess one thing that I think maybe is misunderstood is that um, I think that Fry is um, talking a lot about Schleiermacher, but he's not actually talking about Schleiermacher. And that he's actually, and what I was saying is that actually his biggest concern is with Harnack and that program. It seems that you are drawing Harnack and Schleiermacher together a little bit more tightly than I think what I was implying in a lot of ways. I did not so much argue for that here. So um, I guess that was the first point. And I, I think much of what you said um, is really helpful and uh, probably, I mean, certainly the paper can be improved by um, appreciating um, more deeply a lot of those points you've made. Um, I guess on Harnack, um, just briefly, I, I think it's really important what you said about Harnack and maybe for a different reason from what 
is particularly his identity and his political identity and over reading this episode of 1914 as a summation on his life. I've, I've kind of written elsewhere about this danger we have. And this was like, this is actually the first time I've ever written in the Bart Harnack debate because it's a far larger episode in Bart's life, you know, or it seems to be if, you know, you see like whether like Bart scholars talk about it much more than Harnack people talk about it. Um, it's not a big event for him so much. Um, and that just kind of happens to be where he is in the world. But I guess the, why I think it's important to raise what you said is that we need to do, we sometimes kind of disregard Harnack because of this 1914. And we just kind of shove him out of the way. And we don't actually deal with, particularly in kind of the discipline I'm in with historical theology, we don't actually deal with his continuing legacy in the ways of just largely kind of accepting what um, kind of the patterns of scholarship and the excellence that he set down. And so so basically we say, oh, oh, he was just this kind of warmonger, set him off to the side, nothing needs to be said about him, let's just disown him. But no, he's a much more complicated figure, but you know, it personally, he's got, um, you know, uh, you know, knowing and getting to know, you know, kind of the more personal side of him in the last few years here about the legacy he has, he, you know, he's not someone you would be embarrassed to know at all in the kind of the sense that I think we get sometimes, at least in the Anglophone world. But, you know, there are serious, um, I think, consequences of how he went about um, kind of historical theology that I think are far more important to talk about. And the backstory behind all this, I think actually really starts with like Union and this, this actually reception of Harnack at Union and then kind of moving forward from that, that was where it's kind of the bigger paper was kind of really interested in was that and then how we get these kind of fragments of Harnack later on being circulated, particularly around Yale. Um, I guess, finally, just the last point. Um, I, I think we definitely agree on that there's something does kind of come after these genealogies, um, that they're not you know, just something we do. Um, but I guess the, I, I want to like say is that just like saying that does not like actually dissolve any of the problems here. Um, there are multiple genealogies and actually like multiple visions that might come out of that. And the sense of like pushing the conversation to say, actually, this forces us to talk about what's the nature of theological education, actually probably makes the conversation much more difficult to have, but actually much more important. And like staying in the realm of kind of these kind of more um, kind of intellectual stories is a little bit safer than maybe the direction I'm pushing to say, actually, let's talk about um, how we're actually going to like draw some insights into institutions um, themselves and structure the theological education itself. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Christine, do you have any brief just want to say of that? Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate appreciate the, the dialogue. Um, uh, Fry did write on Schleiermacher and the founding of, of the University of Berlin in 1809. It's a rather kind of tortured article. Um, but he really did struggle with that, the genealogy, Schleiermacher, um, Harnack, and Frey. Um, in my own work, um, How Luther Became the Reformer, I, I started, um, uh, I set out to write a genealogy, um, but then I actually, I think I, think I prefer, and, and this is going back to your opening comments about is genealogy um, the appropriate genre for the theological production of knowledge today. I mean, uh, genealogy is usually about the struggle of modernity. Um, and I'm wondering if the questions that we're posing in theology aren't so much struggles of modernity, but struggles for today. How, how are we going to address the many, many challenges facing us as, 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 as religious practitioners, as theologians, as academics today? And, and maybe I, I, I'm sensing a discomfort in our discussions over the past two years with the way that genealogy has been done in the past. And I hear us kind of groping for new ways of looking at transhistorical change, um, but with the purpose of, of determining how, theolo how theology needs to change in order to address the, the, coming, the coming years. And um, I think uh, in, the, in the work of writing, writing this book, 
I, I would prefer to capture it as um, either forensic historiography or as reception history. And by that, I mean really looking at the political and social context in which these theological ideas emerged. And of course, that is a theological claim that theology is actually the questions of theology and the methods of theology and the institutions in which theology takes place have to do with political, social, and cultural developments. And I really was intrigued about the German political context really shaping and mutually inflecting the way that Harnack and Bart and then and then the um, the, the the proponents of the of the Deutsche Christen like Immanuel Hirsch um, uh, and Paul Althaus were doing in the in the 1930s. So I very much see the significance of looking at history, history, looking at how politics shapes theological ideas. And so I think in my own mind, I'm moving away from genealogy as this sort of account of sort of transhistorical free floating ideas and then moving much closer to the ground to look at shifts as um, uh, with their political presuppositions and, um, and implications. Uh, but I really thank you for the discussion, uh, the opportunity to discuss your paper and I'm looking forward to hearing from other people. Thank you. Who would like to uh, pose a question or raise an issue? Uh, yes, John. And you're muted. There you go. I've done it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, Christine um, whether she thinks that in the case of Schlamacher, there's what I would see as a typically Teutonic tension between um, kind of the bad boy, young, extra university romantic who's a friend of um, the Schlegels and so on and the more mature academic who becomes Teutonically tedious um, in a way that I'm afraid I find typical. Uh, I, like I like the German rebels, but not the German university people. Uh, and <laughs> that remains true. So, um, but it seems to me that, you know, the young Schleiermacher is seriously interesting. And oddly, when he's most pantheistic, I think he's the most interesting from the point of view of Christian orthodoxy, because it's at that point that, you know, his sense of feeling, uh, uh, you know, which which everybody usually misunderstands, as you know, you know, is is kind of an integrative action. So he's associating religion with the, with the integrative. But when it sort of slides into this Kantian space, um, it becomes more dubious that, you know, religion becomes simply a category of, of, of knowledge, rather like the aesthetic for Kant. And, 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 and then theology can be carefully slotted into a subordinate position in, in the university, you know, and now philosophy is essentially the higher faculty and theology becomes um, a lower practically orientated faculty. And to my mind, you know, part of my genealogy of the university and theology would be that's a catastrophe. That's handing over the, the position of integrative supremacy to philosophy. From that point onwards, you are going to lose the battle. It's inevitable. Thank you for, um, for your question. And um, I, um, I, I would like to also ask if, if Ruth Ravenscroft, I know she's, she's somewhere out there, um, uh, would have, have something, something to say about this, especially the early Schleiermacher, um, which, um, who she knows better than I. Um, but I do know something about Schleiermacher in the university, and I would actually like to underscore what I, what I claimed in my response uh, was that um, I think there's a misunderstanding of how um, how Schleiermacher um, integrates theology as a positive science into the repertoire of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I mean, I think that we, we tend to misunderstand the Faculty of Arts and Sciences as philosophy, and somehow theology is going to be parasitic of that and dictated by the rationality of whatever is going on in the university that is de derived independently of um, theology, and I, I really think we need to take a look, a, a look at Schleiermacher. Eilert Herms is absolutely brilliant on this point. The Cambridge Companion to Schleiermacher, and other scholars, including me, um, who have written on this topic. And 
what happens is that Schleiermacher is inventing, is organizing the university and dividing it up into the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which are the real sciences, and theology, law, and medicine as the positive sciences. And the way to understand philosophical theology or the introduction to the Christian faith is to look, as I suggest, as a way of theology's capacity to communicate its contributions to a broader audience. And communication always means listening and understanding and, re and reciprocity. So when Schleiermacher is talking about deriving certain propositions from ethics, ethics is not ethics being morals in the way we understand it today, but ethics is from the Greek, um, which means this uh, kind of a study of human agency and ethics can, is actually institutionalized in the various fields of the humanities and the emerging social sciences of the 20th century. So what Schleiermacher is doing is he's looking at who the human person is. What does it mean for humans to live in, so, in a social organization like the church? On what grounds? And he is in the introduction to the Christian faith, trying to find a place uh, or the different places that Schleiermacher can use to create, create academic discussions. He does not want theology to be um, a, a, a sort of a bombastic discourse all on its own. Theology's no knowledge is produced with other truth telling and knowledge producing institutions. Um, so I do not at all see theology as being derivative or um, an appendix, but rather theology as a historical enterprise, which begins in paragraph 30, 32 of the Christian faith and moves forward, is an explication of Christian doctrine as it was considered norm normatively in history. Yeah but the actual location of Christianity as a religion with its particular relations to context, culture, society, history, that is, that's not philosophy. I mean, philosophy for Schleiermacher is dialectic, which is something completely different. Um, and I have written on that as well. Um, but the actual structure of the university needs to be taken into consideration. And I do not see anything sort of derivative. I, I see Schleiermacher wanting to, take theology seriously as it had been for a thousand years as a production of knowledge. And with the creation of the University of Berlin, which he was instrumental in doing, um, allowing for theology to do that. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify, I think what many people have misunderstood. Can I, can I say just something very, very quickly in response? I mean, I think the alternative to that is not the idea that theology is bombastic and um, speaking about everything um, out of its own voice, because this would be impossible. Theology can't be like that, because it can only speak about the unknown God indirectly. It, it only is ever speaking always about everything else. But that's not the same as thinking of theology as, as a positive um, discipline. Because the, the danger then is that you are regionalizing it. You're sort of situating it as just one more thing between within being, talking about a particular aspect of being. And once you've done that, it can't be talking about God, or it can only be talking about God uh, as an idol. That, that's the danger, that it's, it's betrayed the very comprehensiveness of its intellectual mission, which is not a kind of ridiculous claim to self-promotion, but precisely because it is trying to talk about God and trying to talk about Christ. Yes, I, I appreciate um, trying to uh, navigate and figure out um, together with you and the other people mm -hmm. at this conference where theology can be located to what it can speak and its kind of and its limitations. I mean, I think I disagree with what you just said about theology being a um, um, a, a theology's kind of relativism vis-a-vis -vis other disciplines being a problem. I think it is actually a strength um, and that, um, and I think from that per perspective of epistemic modesty and epistemological humility, I think we can, we can address the problem. Yeah, we we of can't, today. Be, Excuse me, we I, can't I, be humble I'm, on God's I'm talking, I'm talking please. Um, yeah, but it's important to say that. Um, I, I, I would like to explain yeah. the, point at which I disagree with you. Um, and I think that from this particular perspectival picture, we can actually engage together in um, uh, better diagnostics of the problems facing us today. And then 
come up with ways in which we can witness to glimpses of grace, even amidst um, so many uh, systemic sure. evils. Um, we are we are trying to work and see if we can bring Ruth in, but are we ready, Austin? May, maybe just just while we wait for Ruth, I I quite like to follow up. Oh, there she is. Please, Ruth. <laughs> Hello, um, sorry, I completely lost the thread of the discussion for about 10 minutes while John and Christine were talking. So the last thing I heard was John asking about Schleiermacher and whether the, the early Schleiermacher can be reconciled with the later Schleiermacher. And um, I make no, um, I'm not embarrassed about the fact that in my book on Schleiermacher, I deal entirely with the early Schleiermacher. And I think it's because I am similarly excited by him as a romantic and his yeah. um, his creative enterprise. And 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 and, and, and like Christine, I, I thoroughly endorse his, his, his critique of Kant in that phase of his life um, from you know the same perspective of someone like Jacqueline Marina, uh, Marina, who's done an immense amount of work on how Schleiermacher overcomes the Kantian reduction of the self to um, reason. Um, and therefore, as he says in the speeches, reduces metaphysics to a sort of anthropocentric scheme where the mind generates reality from itself. So, I, you know, I'd, my position as a theologian is, you know, my get out is to critique the later Schleiermacher via the earlier Schleiermacher and to sort of um, see a promise in, in the early Schleiermacher that I don't think completely overwrites or overrules the later Schleiermacher. I, I think there's a, a, an immense amount of continuity between the two halves of his self. Um, you know, the same conservatism that comes in as he, you know, he games in prominence at the University of Berlin comes in in his social practice, you know, just as I, I'm excited by his ability to work in a salon context and engage with uh, with um, with women as as equals he later on will will start to 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 treat them in a more sort of pastoral pastoral way in a very conservative Protestant sense um, where the woman is confined to the domestic realm, which you know is obviously not something I'm particularly on board with from a different time. Um, but I, I do think his his later um, work can be yeah can be over can be critiqued by by the early work in a way, but also in a way that, yeah, and I, I, I sort of came in um, when Christine was talking about his metaphysics and about the, the place of theology. And I think Schleiermacher, yeah, he is he is humble. And maybe that's a, that's a point of resistance perhaps between you, John, and, and Schleiermacher in the end, is that Schleiermacher as a, hermen, a hermeneuticist, and not, there's a, a degenerative conversation perhaps to be had there. I think Schleiermacher is extraordinarily aware, as we all know, about his particularity, about his sense of being a finite agent. And that's what distanced him from the romantics too. You know, the romantics as poets wanted to re-mythologize, re reinterpret the, the universe as, as geniuses. Um, whereas he, as an ordained minister, saw himself speaking in from the position of finitude, um, and always remaining in that position of finitude. Um, and that characterizes his whole methodology really as someone who cannot speak from, in abstraction from his particular place um, as, a, as a Christian author um, in a Prussian context. And, and that in the end, you know, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's not a relativism because he believes that God is the absolute, is the transcendent author of the, the entire world, but we ca he cannot get at God other than as, as a Prussian, other than as a, as a Christian, but he's willing to accept that those of other religious dispositions also can know God from where they are. Um, so, yeah, I think in the end, that's what pushes him to come to this compromise in the university and say, look, philosophy can become the organizing discipline. And that's um, in thinking in terms of the whole of knowledge. But yeah, I'm waffling now, so I'll stop. But um, that would be my my sort of provisional response to your, you know, very interesting question for me about the early and the later. Uh, can I can I just say something very, very, very briefly? I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I think I, I, I resonate very strongly with the way R Ruth is is seeing things. Um, obviously, my my only my only um, reservation is, is about then sort of handing the architectonic role to philosophy. And I, I would just want to say, how fair is that to people like, you know, the Schlegels and like Novalis, um, because they insist on the fragmentary. So it seems to me that they, they, they've got this tension between the need to speak of the whole, not, not out of kind of 
personal arrogance of genius, but, but out of a kind of human responsibility. But they know they can only do that in a fragmentary, stuttering kind of way, rather than in terms of a system. No, that's that's absolutely right. Sorry, wait, I'll be two seconds. Um, yeah. But I think for Schlegel, I think in his early life, um, as as a sort of 18, you know, on the 18th century boundary, before he converted to Catholicism anyway, he saw the poet as the mediator between finite and infinite rather than Christ. So that was his sort of separation from Schleiermacher, who was saying, you know, the Christ is the mediator to whom we respond as, as, as finite subjects, whereas the poet is not. Whereas I think Schlegel and Novalis saw the poet yeah. Yeah. As if you see what I mean. Yeah. 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 No, no, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and aptly so, we are finite agents with a finite time. And I must bring our wonderful conversation uh, to a close, but more on Germany to come tomorrow. So this is a, just the beginning, really. Uh, tomorrow we have three uh, sessions, and in various ways, uh, we'll touch upon uh, developments in, in German philosophy and theology and uh, etc. So I thank all the panelists today, all the speakers. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Br Brad, uh, Ragnar, John, uh, Christine, and Jonathan, and Ruth as well. And um, I look forward to seeing uh, you again back tomorrow at the same time.